Okay, Mr. Jason, you are all set to go. All right, so hello everyone. So my name is Jason Coburn. I'm a senior music education major at Keene State College. And this is my presentation on teaching strategies that support students who stutter in the classroom. So I'm interested to see what people um, know about stuttering before this presentation and then after. So let's just start off and let's meet a second grader who stutters. And if you haven't met me before, that is me. <laughs> That's me in second grade. Um, so I do stutter. I've stuttered my whole life since I was about three years old. And it's something that's been kind of a challenge for me and I've wanted to just dive more into and keep doing more research on. So what is stuttering? So stuttering is a speech disorder with a, with a disruption on speech flow. And it is most common in children ages two to six. Um, so it's usually in a lot of younger students, you'll see it kind of develop as kids get older and once they start um, learning to speak. And periods of stuttering will usually last around six months occasionally, will last longer. So usually only about 1% of students will be stuttering past age um, two to six. So it does happen, but every time you see a student stuttering, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be stuttering for their whole life. It might just be a short term, um, just a phase through their life. So there's three different types of stuttering. So the first one is called repetitions, and this is what I have. Um, so it's like where you start a word and you just can't complete it, so you just keep repeating the same portion of the word over and over again. So be like, I wa, 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 want to play music. Uh, so it's just one small portion of the word that keeps getting repeated. And then another type of um, stuttering is prolongations, where instead of repeating it, you just elongate this one portion of a word. So I want to play music. And then the third and last one is a block where this is probably the hardest one. And I've met people who have done this before, and this has always been really difficult to see. Um, and it's when people really just can't even pronounce a word. They just get stuck on it and they might get stuck from 10 to 15 seconds where they want to say a word and they just physically can't. And it's really hard, especially for children um, socially who have this. And it's one of the most difficult ones to get rid of during speech therapy. So the block is usually the toughest one. It's a lot more rare, but they do occur. And so possible traces of stuttering. There's been a lot of science and a lot of studies on this. They haven't quite been able to pinpoint it, but most links um, are believed between family history, uh, brain differences, just from how people process information, which I'm the only one in my family that stutters. No one else in my family does. So that link, there are some links, but it's not like it gets passed down like other um, conditions people might have. And stuttering is not linked to any other learning challenges. The reason I have this presentation for everyone is because when I was in school, they didn't know what was wrong with me. They thought I had a learning challenge because I was stuttering. So they were giving me all this extra help and all of these different things because they thought I was stuttering. And they thought that I had something wrong with me or a learning challenge. So just know that if you know someone who stutters, it does not necessarily mean they have a learning challenge. It's just specifically how they talk. And I conclude that mine just came from possible anxiety. I found that when I'm speaking, not by myself, but in large groups, I find it's still more consistent. And for me, it still happens today. I still do it all the time. So I think anxiety is definitely a contributing factor to some of these um, traces. And so what causes stuttering in children? Statistics just show that it's more likely in males than in females. Um, and my screen's a little cut off there. Oh, there we go. Um, if it begins around age four, it's more likely to last longer than six months. So if it starts a little bit later, then it's more likely to just kind of keep going. Um, and then B 
being excited or feeling rushed increases the chances of stuttering, which is exactly what happens with me when I'm in large groups or I have to speak over lots of people, then I tend to stutter more. And um, children will try to avoid using certain phrases that will make them stutter. And this is absolutely true because one of the most difficult things for me, even student teaching right now, is saying students' names because in my daily life, when I would greet people, I would usually stutter on their name. So anyone who knows me probably might not know this, but I really don't say people's names very much. I'll use generic um, nouns and ways to describe people, but I'll very rarely call them their names unless if they're really close to me. So that's been really difficult for me, student teaching, just saying someone's name. So it is true because even at age 21 making this presentation, I still do all of these. And stuttering is usually worse than by itself because once you know you have it, then you become aware of it, other people become aware of it, and it's just kind of a spiral that keeps going. So can stuttering be fixed? If stuttering lasts over six months, students should see a speech therapist. Once stuttering lasts over six months, then it's not just a short-term condition that younger students might have. It's most likely something that students are going to have for a long period of time. And it can't be fixed, but it can be avoided by being um, changed in kind of daily habits. So stuttering isn't like an illness where you can just... Um, get it and then get and then take like some antibiotics and then feel better stuttering is continuous so the only way to avoid it is by um, changing the way a student speaks and stuttering is mostly prevented by speaking slower so the way i solve my stuttering in most students is just by slowing down their speech and speaking a little bit slower so that's one of the best ways to help stuttering um, is there any questions so far? This presentation, I don't know if anyone has any questions. I know there's kind of a lot of information. No. All right, I'll keep going. Um, so what is speech therapy like? So it's a little different than what most people might think. It's usually a meeting once a week or every other week, depending on um, how bad the stuttering is and how much, um, how much the student probably needs to be seen. It's very interactive and enjoyable for students. So I know for me, when I went to speech therapy, it was one of my favorite things. I look forward to it every single week. And the point of speech therapy isn't just to sit there and kind of like tell kids how to speak or things like that. It's practicing speaking in their daily lives. So you'll do activities and games that are very similar to how a student might live. So it's completely different. So it's actually a really fun and enjoyable thing for students to go to. And it is, um, yeah, so it's much different than people think. It's more on self-confidence and social skills, which is really, really important with um, stuttering. And throughout my week, like I said, it was my favorite place to go. And um, therapists talk to students about their daily life and integrating changes in their habits. So like I said, just as a, just to reword it again, it's just keep repeating it and practice the daily life because that's really important for students. Um, so fun ways to help students stutter. So turtles are actually, um, that was kind of the mascot I used when I was younger because we would talk about speaking slower. So we would put turtle stickers all around my house to try and remind me to speak slower. So I was really lucky that my parents were um, really on board with trying to help me and they were so supportive through all of this. So I'm really, really lucky. Um, so one way to help is submitting articles. There's plenty of stuttering organizations where you're able to go and submit um, like small introductions and biographies about yourself to, um, to like bigger articles and newspapers. And I know for me, this was like the coolest thing when I was able to have an article in this because when you're in second grade and you see your name in something, it's so, so cool. So that's just, you can just read it a little bit. But so that's how I was feeling in second grade with the whole thing because it's really difficult to get other younger students to kind of understand how stuttering is, how stuttering is and what, 
like what goes on with stuttering. So if the class isn't educated, it can be really difficult for students. And then, so this is just another example. What's really, really cool is at UNH every summer, I'm not sure if they still do it or not, but they had a stuttering camp. So I went there for probably a week every day and I was around a bunch of other students who stuttered and kind of what this um, small article talks about, like how they say, we feel better because we thought we were the only nine-year-olds who stuttered. And so when students are able to interact and be around other students that stutter, it definitely gave me and the other students more confidence when they went back to school. And so how to help students in your class who stutter. So this is kind of a do nots and do's list with students who stutter. So do not interrupt the student or complete words for them. Instead, let them finish what they are saying. Once you kind of draw attention to it, that's when it becomes more difficult for students. So just let them talk like you would let any other student talk. And so do not look away. Keep eye contact throughout the student speaking. This is really important because it shows that you're listening and it really helps the students feel like you care about what they have to say. And do not make any remarks to how the student says words only give the students feedback on what they say. So no matter how long it takes the student or how difficult it might have been to pronounce their words, just answer them like any other student. And do not speak quickly after the student's answers. Pause for a second or two and then respond slowly. This is kind of what I was talking about earlier in that speaking slower is really important for students who stutter and when you're a classroom teacher that has these students for 180 days a year, they're going to start mimicking actions you do. So if you speak slower, then those students are more likely to speak slower too. So that's something to keep in mind as you're teaching to remember how much of a role model you really are to students. And so addressing the class about stuttering, this was really, really difficult for my class. Um, I know I was lucky because I had a really awesome second grade teacher, but it was still, it's still difficult to get kids to kind of understand what stuttering is. So do not address it unless if the students or speech therapists specifically say that they're okay with talking about it. So this is really important. If the parents and um, the rest of their family is not on board with helping about the stuttering, there's really not that much you can do. What, like, kind of what I talked about in the last slide, we're just speaking slower. That's about all you can do to help your student and just make them feel comfortable in the classroom. But don't try any of these next things unless if you have talked to the parents and their speech therapists about some of these items. Um, but if you do see it, just address it like any other teasing or bullying. Their children, they're still trying to learn and understand new things. So just making sure that you address it like teasing or bullying without bringing any more attention to it, that's really important to make that student feel comfortable and feel like any other student. And even just if you want to generally address the class about teasing and bullying, um, the more educated everyone is, the better. So as, if your students are aware of it and understand what it is, like, oh, okay, that's just how he speaks. It doesn't mean anything else about him. Once students kind of understand that, then it's much easier um, for everyone to understand it and the teasing will most likely um, go down a little bit. So that's really important, just making sure everyone feels welcomed and that you treat it just like any other teasing that's going on. So support your students, they really appreciate it. I know I really appreciate still to this day what my parents and my um, teachers did throughout this whole thing. Like I said earlier, if there's no support at home, just have them speak slower. Um, so don't bring it up if you're not in contact with the parents, because then that just brings more attention and the parents might not want help with it. So that's something you need to be completely aware of. And like I said before, just speak slower. It's a great example for your students. And do what I did, which is find the place they can publish an article about stuttering. That's always really, really exciting for students. You have to think in the mind of a second grader and what was really cool to second graders. And to have your students make a poster. I even made a poster. It's still up in my attic, I think, when I was cleaning out 
stuff once I moved back home. It's still there. So even I made posters and I hung it up and people that walk by get to see it. So even things like that are really exciting for students. And then, so this is my personal, one of my favorite things that I've seen probably within the last year. So Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States, um, wow, almost four years ago now, he came to Keene State and it's kind of popped up in the media more recently, but Joe Biden also stutters. And so he was talking to a Keene State student that stuttered and they had a really nice conversation. So this is the video of it. It's a short video, but it's really, really awesome. Hopefully you get audio through my computer. By the way, you know, I used to be a very bad stutterer. Yeah, I know. It's hard to and, uh, and I've spoken up a lot about it. I'm involved with the national organization as well. Yeah. Don't, it does not define you. I know. It cannot define you. I know. And by the way, you know, it's a, it's a matter. I wish we could talk more. Yeah. You give me your number, I'll, I'll call you. I know it's hard to talk on the phone. I know that. I know that's the most difficult thing to do. When I was in your age, I would be so that's kind of the extent of the video but it just every time i see that it almost like brings a tear to my eye because being a role model like that, being the vice president and really feel like you're listening to people. It's like, that's the effect you can have on your students with stuttering. So that video, that's one of my favorite videos throughout this whole, um, throughout the last couple of years that I've seen through kind of popular media. So, and then that kind of goes on to do any famous people stutter. So you can look at the list. It's a crazy amount of people that you probably didn't even know stuttered. I mean, you have people whose job it is to pretty much talk and speak, and they all, um, a lot of them are on this list, like even Tiger Woods and Andrew Lloyd Webber. I mean, people who are icons in their genres and even really famous actors. Uh, it's really a significant list. It's pretty exciting um, and pretty surprising to see how many people really do stutter. Um, this is just kind of a small picture I made of just all of the amazing things that people who stutter, uh, all the things they accomplished. And it's a pretty, their resume is pretty amazing with some of the amazing things they've done and some of the accomplishments. And another thing I just wanted to quickly note was if you go back and you watch Star Wars with Darth Vader, with James Earl Jones, and some of the other um, films that he uses his voice, also a great voice he has, Notice that Darth Vader talks really slow. Notice Mufasa talks really slow. It's not really a coincidence. That's because James Earl Jones, even in interviews, you'll see him stutter. So especially when he's recording voices, he talks slower and most of his characters do that. So I just think that's kind of an interesting um, aspect that even those subtle things, it's like speaking slower. It's like anyone who stutters does that. So people, so just because your student stutters, that does not mean they're not going to accomplish some amazing things. So now we're kind of near the end of the presentation. Does anyone have any questions for me? I'm happy to answer them. Emily. Jason, that was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Um, I also went to speech therapy because I had a terrible lisp growing up and it's still kind of there. Um, I was wondering if your research on speech therapy was in school speech therapy specifically, or if you got any sort of information about um, children going to speech therapy outside of school. Because um, mine was in school. Oh, really? Yeah. I, because actually when I grew up too, I still, I struggled with pronouncing a lot of words. I still do today. Um, and I know for me, there were certain vowels and things like that. Um, like I remember the TH sound, I really had trouble pronouncing. So I had, I actually did have that speech therapy when I was in school, but that was kind of the extent of it. They didn't really address 
the stuttering. But so this was mostly about um, the speech therapy outside of school. I should have been more specific on that. No, um, thank for you. Stuttering specifically, I went outside of school for that. But then in school, they would pull me out of class sometimes and work on kind of just my speech in general, but they didn't really address stuttering. But I think now, um, because it is amazing, I was in elementary school, what, 15 years ago? So I think it's definitely changed a little bit. So back then, I might have not quite had the help with the stuttering, but I think today it's something people are definitely more aware of. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Howard. Thank you, Jason, for your presentation. And as you know, when you proposed this topic, I had no idea that you uh, had um, done so much work to overcome your stuttering. And I had heard you teach for hours and hours. So I just want to compliment you on the work that you've put in to be a clear speaker. But I do want to ask you, is there any kind of maintenance or exercises or self-talk that you do now when you start to feel like you're getting tripped up? How do you sort of self-care with your stutter? Right. So what I do is I will just kind of pause and just stop and then just start again and try slower. So I just immediately in my head, I'll just think, speak slower, speak slower, and then it kind of fixes itself. So that's what I kind of do. Um, it's definitely hard in the moment because you know you're stuttering, you know what's happening, and you know there's not really much you can do about it. But just speaking slower in general is the only way that I've really um, been able to kind of help with this. So that's what I do. I'll just stop and I'll just say, just pause, breathe, and then speak, and it's usually okay. Can I ask one more follow up? I know Dr. Zafini also sure. has a question. Uh, <laughs> What do you think is the reason for your stuttering with student names? Can you talk about that? I don't, this is where I kind of feel it's like the anxiety because I always had trouble pronouncing things. So I think I was always worried I would pronounce someone's name wrong. And then, um, so I was always afraid to say names. I know even student teaching when I would go through the list of names and the names now are a little different than when we were in school and trying to pronounce them. And that's like the most horrifying thing to me is like pronouncing names on the first day. So I don't know why it's been like a problem for me, but I think it's just kind of an anxiety of knowing that like the spotlight turns right on you when you kind of call someone by their name. I think that's kind of where it's linked from. So now Dr. Zafini. Jason, I loved, can you hear me? I think yeah. I, okay. I absolutely loved that presentation. I'm so proud of you. It, 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 ter it turned out excellent. Um, and I just loved how you're so calm and presenting. I just wanted to compliment you on that. Uh, but also, you know, as you all know, um, from being adaptive with me, you know that my older son also went through a stuttering phase. So Jason, and he had the prolongations version mm -hmm. of the stuttering and went to speech therapy and all that stuff. Jason, I'm wondering for you, because we are just getting out of this phase with my son, mm -hmm. um, if your stutter ever internally translated to you, feeling like maybe that you were, I don't know, I mean, I feel like you were like not as smart or um, there was something extra wrong with you, you know, things that I see my son having gone through. And I'm wondering if, you know, if, if that translated for you, um, how long did it take you to realize that that wasn't the case, that there's nothing wrong with you? <laughs> um, it probably took me, I would say, till the end of that school year, the end of second grade after doing speech therapy for almost a year, probably when I went to um, that session at UNH. Because it is so hard because I don't know what happened with your son, but most teachers didn't know what it was. They thought something else was going on or something was really wrong with how my brain was. And I know it was hard for me because they were pulling me out of class all the time. They were making me do all these extra things, but I didn't have like an actual IEP at all. So they were um, like taking me out of class and they thought something was wrong with me and like giving me extra help with learning and not saying that I wasn't appreciative of that. but 
I could just tell them like, is there something wrong with me? Like, is this, does this show that I don't know what I'm doing? So I'm not necessarily blaming the school, but I did feel like something was wrong with me. And when other students were kind of teasing me about it, I know it, like most students, it really lowers your self-esteem. So it probably took me until I took all those extra steps, like I talked about, like making a poster and doing all of these extra sessions and things like that, where I started to really feel comfortable and kind of help with it a little bit. Thank you very, very much. It's really great to hear your story and then see years later how just amazing that all ended for you. You know what I'm saying? It's just, and how you're using it to really better inform um, your friends and your family and just teachers in general. It just makes me so happy that you took it, you're taking it and you're using it for the betterment of everybody around you. So I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Is there any other questions? I see no other hands. One last thing I just quickly wanted to do. There's just one more slide. Um, so these are just some resources. Um, ASHA, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, they have amazing resources. Like they even have this book that's Eight Tips for Teachers, which is really helpful um, for all educators. And there's just an amazing amount of resources. They're all free too. So even me stuttering, I read through those and I found so many exciting new things that I didn't even know. So they're definitely worth a read. They don't take too long. But these are just a couple of different associations. Um, those are a great start to help you. So just one last time, are there any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you all listening to my presentation. It's certainly been something that's been a huge part of my life. So I thank you so much for taking the time. Excellent. Nice job. I'm going to stop the recording.